Right. Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Mark Motor, Berean Church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. Pete Jack Looney, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. You guys ready to do like a deep dive today? We're are we ready, ready to do a deep dive? Let's All do right, it. I hope you're ready to do Put a deep the dive. Gear on. Yeah, that's right, because today on Hard Questions, we're taking on your questions from the hotline that deal with everything from the triune God to Ben Hur. So <laughs> let's start with this. And my question, it's a very confusing kind of question. God the Father, Son, God the Jesus, Jesus been around since whatever. I don't agree with that for the simple fact that he sits at the right hand of the Father. He was a man. Number one, when Jesus prayed, did he pray to himself? If he was God, was he talking to himself when he prayed? He said, our Father who's in heaven. Then again, when they asked him, when are you coming back? She states, only my father knows. So how can he be father and son? And it's one person. Did he deceive people or lie? He, Jesus didn't know the time that he's coming. He said, only my father knows. But I, I, I still don't buy it. It's, he's one and the same, I understand. But he sits at the right hand. Who sits at the left? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to solve who sits at the left, but we do want to talk about this, uh, this whole situation of Jesus and God and God the Father. Pastor Glaze, can you kick us off? Yeah, well, I think there's a big misunderstanding in the question, and, and that is the Trinity. There you go. Because when you look at the Trinity, you know, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. They're all co-eternal, they're co-equal, and they're of co-essence that Jesus has been with the Father from the very beginning. You know, if, if you want to have your mind blown, just try to think about how long has God been here? Mm -hmm. From everlasting to everlasting. I mean, I can't fathom that. But as long as God has been here, which has been everlasting, Jesus has been here. Right. And, and they've had that eternal fellowship. And so, you know, he asked the question about, well, does Jesus pray to himself or Jesus don't know? Well, you know, that, that takes us to Philippians chapter two. Mm -hmm. And it says this, but, but Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, mm -hmm. made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Uh, and theologians call this the kenosis passage and it deals with Jesus emptying himself. Well, what did he empty himself of? Uh, he emptied himself of the right to exercise his deity. So there was times that when he submitted to the father mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that he didn't know when he was coming back. Not that he didn't know, but he chose not to know because he submitted to the father. That there were times when he prayed, when he was on the cross, he prayed to the father. Well, Jesus said, I could call down angels and wipe everybody out. Yeah. But what did he do? He submitted himself to the Father. He never stopped being God. He just clothed himself in flesh and, and then at that point, you know, clothed his deity. Never stopped being deity. He clothed it and yielded himself to the Father. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a good place to go first because this really does strike to the, the uh, deity. deity of Christ. Well, deity of Christ. His virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his atoning work, his ascension into heaven. Every one of those proved the deity of Jesus Christ. Yeah, even the, he accepted worship. You know, uh, you know, Thomas said, my Lord, my God, when he, when he saw him after the resurrection, you know. And so he accepted worship. Jay. Also think, too, when you're talking about them being three in one, even though they're separate, they're one in regards to what you see me do, Jesus said, the Father would do. They're, they're of one mind. Uh, it's not like, well... God the Father is going here, God the Son is going here. They're always working together with the same purpose, with the same mind, with the same everything. Uh, it, it, it gets so deep because, you know, people talk about, sometimes talk about like when you're dealing with the uh, Trinity, you got like ice, water, and steam. You know, all the same thing, but they still have their abilities. I mean, but they, you know, it just depends on which one you're operating in. Even with us as a triune being, uh, spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. Uh, all, it's like I'm my body, but I'm also my, you know, it's all one. So, it, and, and to some degree too, I think we have to also get to a point where you realize 
uh, God is God and there's some stuff you just ain't gonna figure out. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's deeper than that. Like you said, everlasting. Well, when did he start? Yeah. I mean, well, you have to start somewhere. Well, I mean, how do you figure that out? I mean, there's some things that in the Bible says, the secret things belong to the Lord. So some things we can get some theology on it, but then the rest, we have to say, God, you said it, I'm gonna leave you know, it at that. Uh, when, when you talk about that eternity, you know, eternity past and uh, from everlasting to everlasting, I always think the scripture where it says he's the eternal father. Mm -hmm. Well, there had to be an eternal son then, right? Amen. If there is an eternal father, there's an eternal son. Mm. I've heard people say, well, the word Trinity is not even found in the Bible. And that is true. But when you think about it, the truth of the Trinity is found all through the Bible. Mm -hmm. And as early as Genesis 1, here's okay. what the scripture says, God speaking, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And for greater clarity, 1 John 5, 7, there, is, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, Jesus is the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And one more thing I was thinking about, you know, the devil only counterfeits what's already true. And so when you think about it, we've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But when you come to the book of Revelation, you see the mm -hmm. counterfeit, right. and that is Satan mm -hmm. and the Antichrist and the false prophet. So you can even see from Satan's kingdom that he's trying to emulate, he can't, but he's trying to emulate the Trinity. Well, there's so much like that. I mean, it just reminded me of uh, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That's Christ is talking about the Word. You know, one thing, uh, it's almost like the, the uh, person that called is trying to figure God out. And you know, who wants a God that they can figure yeah. out? You know, if, if, if I can figure God out, He's too then, God. then, yeah, yeah, then, then I, I can be God, right? Yeah, right. Uh, I, I, like, I forget who said it, the secret things, you know, and I, you know, I just, you know, uh, I heard E.V. Hill say, he, he said, he said, how, how does a brown cow eat green grass and give white milk? You, you know, you know, we can't figure that out, right? But it's something that we accept and we can't figure the Trinity out. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to understand what it says that he's one but there's three different persons. I'm going to accept that and not, you know, try to figure it out. And when Jesus was praying, even though he was fully God at right. the time he was praying, who was he praying to? He's praying to his father, right? Right. Yeah. But, well, you have immediately at the baptism, you have the spirit descending upon the son. You have the voice of the father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's the Trinity. Yeah. And then immediately after that, you have the spirit driving him into the wilderness for him to be tempted. So you see the, the cooperation of the eternal Godhead. God works outside, the, outside of time. God does not know time. Yeah. And we have to realize that. We live within time. God lives outside of time. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I love what uh, Pastor Mark said about Trinity may not mm. be in the Bible, but the concept, the, mm. the, the actuality of the Trinity is all over the Bible. We just have to look deep enough. Thank you so much for your question. It was a great one. Good discussion. Let's go on to the next hotline question. Can you tell me why the book of Acts in the New Testament is called Acts, A-T-S, Acts? It sounds like a weird name that doesn't relate to the Bible at all to me. The book of Acts, one of my favorites. Love the book of Acts. Pastor Mark. Well, it's called the book of Acts or sometimes the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, that was a name given to it. But remember that Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, Dr. Luke. And in Acts 1, he's describing why he wrote what he did. And I just want to read one verse. The very first uh, verse of the book of Acts, he says, This former account have I made to you, O Theophilus, he was writing to him, concerning all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And that word began is important because Luke's gospel talks about what Jesus began to do through his own physical body. But the book of Acts talks about what he continues to do through his church, 
the spiritual body. And so it's called Acts because they did the acts or the works of Jesus. And I believe the book of Acts was more than just a historical record. It is a pattern for the New Testament church. And so we're not just to be sitting and listening. We're to be doing and going and preaching the gospel. And to me, that's the primary reason it was called the Acts. They were doing something with their faith. Okay, so there is an a- action, there's some kind exactly. of action that's well, Paul, happening. Paul even writes later, didn't he say, the acts of the apostle were evident in my life? And what were those acts? People being saved, people being healed, people being delivered. So the whole book, that's what the whole book was about. Yeah. From salvation to deliverance to healings to the pointing of, of the soon coming Lord and Savior. So acts of the apostles. Yeah, you know, like and, and you know, just to deal with it from another perspective, the Greek word for acts, uh, praxis, which is where we get the English word practices. So he's asking the question, why is it called acts? Well, again, the Greek word uh, actually mean practices. So, you know, the practices of the apostles and some people even say the practices of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the word acts actually means in Greek. Practice, you're talking about practice. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. And I also think, I love what you had mentioned. I think that really summarizes it is that uh, I've also heard it meant the acts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, as well, right. that yeah. it's now that though, because the church, it was the birthday of the church, Acts chapter 2. Right. That is when the church truly began. It's when dominion was given back, what was lost in the garden when Adam was naked, now clothed the church again, which was the Holy Spirit. So now we get a chance to see what God's original intent and plan was for his bride. So I love what you said. It's like a, we're supposed to be, that's a prototype or a, a, a blueprint or of how we should be looking at saying, how close are we to that? Yeah. Yeah. This is the true uh, understanding of the church of Jesus Christ and what it looks like. So he's showing us if we're really acting like the church, then this is what it looks like. And I think we've got a ways to go. Can I, can I <laughs> yes, say one absolutely. more thing with that? If it, I don't have an issue with the Acts of the Apostles, except for the fact that if you just think that way, you think, well, when the Apostles died, there are no longer oh, Acts. Yeah, yeah. It is really not the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah, yeah, it is so. the Acts of believers following the Holy Spirit because Stephen was not an apostle and he was doing signs and wonders among the people. Yeah. Philip was preaching in Samaria and seeing great things. So. We need to understand, we don't have the, uh, we're not continuing the book of Acts as far as the canon of scripture, but the acts of the Holy Spirit are still being That's utilized good. and seen well, today. Like good. when I when I was growing up in church, they said, we're still in that book, we're still doing that. And again, the canon's Amen. closed, but the acts, the praxis, the, the, the practice of doing that and following the Holy Spirit is something we are still doing. Great discussion, great, uh, answers. Thank you for the question. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we ask, what age will we be in heaven? Welcome back to the show. We are taking your calls from the hard question hotline. And hey, we love it when you do this. So if you'd like to leave your question, We encourage you to call 412-349-4326, 412-349-4326. We would love to answer your question on the air. Let's go to the next one. When the rapture happens, you know, all the babies that have died, God says we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So does that mean that we're all going to, we'll be 33 years of age, including the babies, or or how's that going to work? Well, I don't know if 33 is the magic age here or not, but I guess it's it's kind of where everything all comes together. But tell me what you think about this, Pastor Jay. Well, I think people think that because that's the time that Jesus died. Okay. So 33 years old, that must be the perfect age uh, to uh, say that's where we're going to be and that's the perfect age of maturity. I, I think a lot of time we're looking at it, it, it kind of goes back to some of the stuff we were talking about before about God being from everlasting to everlasting. We're, we're trying to bring finite time into infinity. Uh, we're trying to bring temporal into eternal and you can't, uh, you know, the Bible talked about in first Corinthians and how we are going to have different bodies, uh, that these bodies will be resurrected, but I, they are not going to be physical that deteriorate. Uh, he said from dust to dust, thou shalt return. Well, we're not going to be created with dust again. 
Amen. You know, we're not, we're going to be created with eternal bodies that we, that require no sleep, that don't lose strength, that don't get weary. I mean, all those types of things. I mean, the whole process and trying to understand eternity. As a matter of fact, I'm in the middle of writing a book right now, uh, and I'm calling it something along the line that heaven's still real, uh, hell's still real, and Jesus is still coming back around that premise because I think we've lost sight of that. Mm -hmm. That heaven, in the study of heaven, when you read about heaven, when you read about eternity, it leaps within you because you start thinking about, wow, you know, you can't fathom what our mm -hmm. bodies are going to be like. We're looking like we're going to come there and I'm going to be just like this. It's not going to be that way. Yeah. The spirit and the body and the soul will all be redeemed. But the age, I think we can't really even look at it that age. I mean, we could be 20 feet tall in heaven. I, I mean, I, I don't even know what we're going to be. The Bible doesn't clearly tell us um, what our features are going to be, but we know that it's going to be eternal. So I, w I wouldn't spend a lot of time getting caught up in that. Mm -hmm. I just say, hey, I know it's going to be redeemed and it's going to be eternal. That's right. And the Bible declares we shall be like him. So however Jesus is yeah. now, yeah. we will be like him. And, and again, we're still, like you said, Jay, we're still caught up in this age time. Yeah. We're still caught into birth dates and uh, there will be no yeah. more birthdays when we are like him. Amen. It's interesting to speculate what things are sure. going to be like. Yeah, though. yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, again, uh, the uh, viewer asked the question about age. And I think, uh, as it's been said, we need to move away from age and maybe look more at appearance. I think that that's how, how will we appear when we're in heaven? Uh, because, you know, when you lock in the age, well, you know, you know, like you said, Jesus was 33 when he died. Uh, but just think, you know, I mean, there, there are limitations at 33. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to be locked into a certain age. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know that in, in the scripture, it says that this mortal shall put on immortality and this corruptible shall put on incorruption. So I, I think that there are at least two things we can say about our bodies is that the corruption that we face mm -hmm. as far as sickness and things mm -hmm. of that nature, that we won't be dealing with it anymore in that body. And then that we'll be able to live forever. You know, this mortal mm -hmm. shall put on immortality. So again, you know, when people ask that question, I try to shift them away from the age uh, concept mm -hmm. to appearance. How, how are we going to appear? Okay, that's really good, Mark. Excellent. And just to piggyback on what Pete had shared, 1 John 3, 2, dear friends, now we are the children of God and what we will be has not yet been known. And so I don't think we'll know on this side of heaven. I agree with all of these statements. I can just give you my personal preference. When I get to heaven, I have a picture that I saved of a, of a man that had this suit, massive muscles, and it was in his closet, and he would pull it out and put it on. So I just know this, I will be tall, with long hair, and massive muscles. What I did not get on this life, I will get in the next. Well, you know, I, I, I told my wife, you know, I said, I got the body of a 20-year-old. And she said, you need to give it back because you're starting to get wrinkled. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let, but before we leave this subject, let me ask you about heaven uh, related to relationships, okay? Because uh, Jesus said, you know, they're, they're not married or given right. in marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we're all married, you know, right. and we're like, our wives are all saved. They're going to be there. What's that? I, I just, what do you think that relationship is going to be like? What do you think our relationships, how will we know people? Well, you know, in, in, in heaven, you know, it's, it's almost like we'll do things to the nth degree. Mm. So relationships here, I mean, you, we think that we love here. Oh. You know, when we get to heaven, you know, the, the, the intimacy level of our love will be so deep and so rich. You know, uh, the Bible says that, you know, in his presence is fullness of joy. Amen. And at his right hand, there are pleasures. That means, you know, extreme pleasures. So I think that relationships up there, you know, just think, you know, we, we can mask things here. Mm -hmm. You know, we can tell people things here and maybe not be fully mean what we say. But in heaven, it, you know, it, we're going to be open. It's going to be heart on heart. It's going to be spirit on spirit. And it'll just be so uh, intimate and that, that it's, it'll be beyond comprehension, the relationships that we'll have. No insecurity. Yeah. No, no, right. <laughs> no intimidation. And to your point, what will make heaven heaven? Nothing in hell will be there. And what yeah. makes hell hell? nothing in heaven will be there. Mm -hmm. So everything uh, in us, right now we're in yeah. this straight betwixt two type thing. We've got yeah. good and evil all in there. But in heaven, anything in us that is wrong or imperfect will be cast out. But everybody in hell, anything that could have been redeemed 
will be removed. And so we can't even fathom how good it's going to be because we're still stuck in this finite time and finite mind. And he'll, he'll wipe away every tear, it yeah. says. He'll heal every hurt, everything that causes us not to act properly in many cases. Mark. Uh, when Paul talked about death, he said, to depart and be with Christ is better. Right. In a word, better. But the Greek says, far, far better. So all I know about relationships, I can't understand everything, but I know this, they will be far, far better than anything we've experienced in this Amen. life. That's really good, really good. Good answer. Thank you so much for the question. Well, coming up, we ask, why isn't the story of Ben-Hur in the Bible? Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Hard Questions. Let's take our last hotline question. My question is the story of Ben-Hur. I think it's a lovely story, but it doesn't seem to have been canonized. And why is it in, it in the Bible? First of all, let me say, I love the story of Ben-Hur. I really do. I love the movie, and uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, but Pete, why isn't it okay. in the Bible? The Bible says... All scripture is inspired by God. So as we have talked about in other programs, we have the Old Testament canonization, we have the New Testament canonization, and then it has been canonized finally. So we're going back probably thousands of years, and now when was Ben-Hur written? Uh, maybe in the 1950s? Early 1900s, I think, or yeah. the, the, the movie? Um, there's a difference between something being inspiring and the inspiration of Scripture. Ma'am, I'm not being unkind. Ben-Hur may inspire you, but Ben-Hur can't even come close to being part of the inspiration, the spoken, the, the living Word of God. That's the only way I can put it. There's other movies that are inspiring. Does that mean we bring other movies into the Bible? And, and, and again, this is what... what really concerns me with Christianity today. They're, they're more concerned about what, what movies say about the Bible and than what the Bible says actually itself. The Word of God stands alone. Now, I'm not saying there can't be other books that are not inspiring, but there's only one spoken Word of God. It's been canonized, and it's forever that way. Yeah. Now, I will say this, there is a Ben-Hur in the Bible. Right. Now, not the story of Ben-Hur, not even the man that we're talking mm -hmm. about in the movie, but I did find this interesting. Yeah. First Kings 4, 7, and 8, Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each man had to make provision for one month in the year. These were their names, and the first one is Ben-Hur. And his name actually means uh, the son of a camel. So for whatever reason, <laughs> Ben-Hur is in the Bible, <laughs> but not the particular Ben-Hur in the movie. It wasn't Charlton Heston either, no, probably it wasn't. not. Pastor Glaze. Yeah, well, you know, when you look at it, and, and I thought Pete brought out a good point about the, the movie being recently, you know, in the last couple centuries, uh, and you look at the Old Testament was canonized somewhere in the first century uh, A.D. or B.C., and the New Testament was canonized around the third or fourth century. So the Bible was already in place. Right. So, you know, and, and it had been uh, taken through. And, and I, I like what uh, Norman Geisler said that, you know, these councils that came, you know, they didn't determine which books would be in the Bible. They discovered which books were going to be in there. You know, it was almost like God had, you know, in, embedded things in the scripture and that those things that, you know, for, you know, like going back to the Old Testament, you know, did Moses write it? Did a prophet write it? Did the Jewish community right. accept it? Right. You know, when you move into the New Testament, did an apostle write it? Did, you know, does it contradict, you know, theology? So, I mean, you know, there were things that were embedded in there. And so these councils discovered what was in the scripture. So, you know, again, Ben-Hur comes years later and, you know, the, the Bible had already been canonized. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And uh, just to have a little thing about Ben-Hur, but any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, you know, I think one of the things, too, you have to be very careful with media nowadays. Yeah. Right. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm getting ready to because I'm probably going to do a little podcast and just stuff on it on this new movie out by Jay-Z and them called The Book of Clarence. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I think in a day and hour where we're missing so much orthodoxy, we have to be careful that go, media Jay. doesn't replace it. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of times, wow, that's a great story. Why then we'll question the scriptures because of a man-made film. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad show or anything on that line. So we just have to be very careful that, and we, we've been talking about this throughout the show today, is that the importance of knowing what your Bible says, Absolutely. knowing about the inspired word of God. What does the Bible say? Even uh, taking classes on how was the canon developed? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have an understanding, this is why it's not in there and understand. So I think that's just very, very important that we don't allow media to replace uh, the word of God. We're, we're, we're breaking down the word so much that, it, that it's losing its full potential and yeah. uh, only to make people satisfied. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And my little thing about Ben-Hur, just uh, the story is that the, there was a, uh, an agnostic uh, person who went uh, to disprove the uh, Bible and he did uh, archeological research in the late 1800s. And what he found led him to faith in Christ. And that is the story. He wrote the book, Ben-Hur, which of course became the movie uh, released in the 50s with Charlton Heston. And so you see, when you do a deep dive into God's stuff, okay, into, God, into, the, into the word, God shows up. I love that. Well, we love to end the, uh, the program with the scripture. And here in Psalms, it says this, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That is Psalm 33, 8, and 9. Well, we hope you've enjoyed today's program. And we want to hear from you. Email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org or call that hotline, 412-349-4326. Have a great day.